Welcome back to What's New with Mead. We are in episode 46, and I have Trent Musho from The Brew Show on today uh, to talk about his homebrewing experience, his YouTube channel, um, just everything that he does in his life. He's got a lot of experience that uh, I'm, I'm interested to dive into. So Trent, <laughs> welcome to the show. We're glad Thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. So um, let's, let's talk about your channel first. Okay. Um, I, I want to get... For anyone who is unfamiliar with you, what is your channel? You know, what's your elevator pitch for it, so to speak? Got it. So yes, as you mentioned, I'm Trent Musho from The Brew Show. And the whole concept is just home brewing simplified, taking um, beer brewing as well as uh, cider making and other fermentation, mainly fermented drinks, and just simplifying the process, trying to put it into the easiest terms possible that any beginner can jump in. Yeah. That's awesome. How long has your channel been around? So I started about a year and a half ago. Oh, well, that's awesome. I just yeah, saw yeah. your numbers too. And, it, and you're, I mean, you're already hitting 15,000 like in <laughs> a year and a half. That is awesome, man. You're crushing it. Yeah. It's been really exciting. Like it, it was always just something I thought about and I had extra time in 2020. So went for it. Yeah. Well, I think we all, that's pretty fun. Were you, um, I guess go backwards then. Obviously, yeah. pandemic time can kind of yield us to, uh, or lead us to do different things. And your mm -hmm. thing was starting this channel. Um, prior to that, when did you start homebrewing? So I probably started around, I would say 2011 or so. Um, I got like a like home wine making kit for Christmas one year. And, you know, pretty much was obsessed with it. The second I got it, you know, I was making yeah. a bunch of mainly just doing wine kits. Um, and then a few years after that, I got a Mr. Beer kit and that was my first intro to beer. And that was something that always seemed so like foreign, like seemed like you needed so much knowledge and so many things to do. Um, and sure, like my first few beers were pretty awful, but I was hooked. <laughs> I would say very few of us have can honestly say our first ones were winners that those first few or <laughs> yeah. anything are always like, they've got they've got problems for sure it's kind of like a badge you have to wear right like your horrible things that you hold on to and then yeah eventually you learn new skills and move on and if you i mean that part of it too is if if somebody says to me yeah my first mead my first wine my first cider was amazing i'm gonna look at them and go are you sure did did you had you tried it both <laughs> had tried another person's because they're just it, it can happen but yeah, it is it, it's tough yeah, or uh, like somebody else try yours. It's always good, you know, to get somebody else yeah. to give you yeah. a second opinion. <laughs> did you give it? Did you go and give it to your mom, who's going to say like, "Oh, this right. is so good," or did you go give it to your friend who who who's going to roast you? I think that's right. a big thing. Um, and I always say that. I try to say that for people when you have a a panel to give them to. Of course, you know your your best friend uh, who loves free booze. They might not be the best say of. <laughs> how how good something is yeah um, you need somebody that's willing to hurt your feelings a little bit <laughs> yeah and it's not a bad thing you it, everybody yeah. needs those friends in your life not just yeah. for home brewing but also for for regular life to call you out and say hey you're you're being an idiot today you should <laughs> get your life yeah, together definitely <laughs> okay so you um kind of worked your way into beer and mm -hmm. nowadays you spend you do a lot of different things um do you have a favored beverage you like to make are you more wine or where are you at now so i would say beer is probably the most rewarding for me i think that just it's probably the thing that i enjoy drinking the most and also just you know i'm i was the type of person that would go out to a brewery and get beer so to have it at home is just always so rewarding mm -hmm. um but i i love as you can see on my channel brewing all kinds of things even if it's you know lacto fermentations like i made a tapache which is fermented mm -hmm. pineapple um, or sake, which was like a pretty wild thing to learn how to do, but yeah. you know, I'm always down to like learn something completely new. Yeah. I've never made sake. Um, but I've used, I took one of the sake yeast one time and then put mm -hmm. it in a mead and it yielded a really weird, um, and interesting oh, wow. result, but it made me now go, okay, I want to try making it. It is daunting though. It seems like such a, uh, I've brewed a lot of things, but it seems so foreign to me to do sake. <laughs> Yeah. And there wasn't a lot on it. Like you can find like some videos, but they're like in Japanese or, mm. you know, there's blog posts, but um, yeah, I kind of wanted to put it in very simple forms and it really is just like getting it's uh, steaming the rice, right. It's like the biggest thing. It's like getting the right rice and steaming it and mm -hmm. the rest of it, 
you know, it's kind of easy. Kind of happens. Yeah. Well, I'll have to. Do you have a video on that? I do. Yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. Great. Well, maybe if I if I remember to in, in post, I'll uh, I'll put that link somewhere yeah, for people for sure. to watch because uh, I know I definitely need to go watch it at some point. Yeah, it's fun. It's fun to have it too when you're making you know Japanese food and just have a little homemade Ooh. sake. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you're at a little over ten years into brewing now, mm-hmm. and um, obviously you've you had a plethora of experiences. Um, let's talk about the ones that maybe didn't go as well. What are some oh. things that um, that you've attempted and they just kind of didn't maybe you uh came back and fixed it later but what did not work out well for you in the past right yeah i mean some of my biggest early mistakes were not paying attention to uh oxidation especially when it comes to beer that's a big one um so you know just rough transferring or opening the lid on the fermenter and not thinking about it you know and it greatly impacts the look the flavor you know especially when it comes to hops um, so that was something that took me a while to kind of figure out, you know, I was tasting my beers and like something's not right, but what is it? But, you know, eventually figuring that out solved a lot of issues. Um, and that's even more important now with like the hazy IPAs, which are extremely susceptible to oxidation and just a little bit can really change the color and flavor. So that was a big hurdle. Um, there's definitely been fermentations I've done that I would say they weren't failures, but they weren't something that I really enjoy. I'm actually working on one right now. Um, it's it's called kanji. I don't know if you've heard of it, but it's mm. uh, it's like a lacto fermented, basically carrot water. Uh, it's an Indian. Oh. It, it it has Indian roots. Um, and it's in my mind, I was like, that sounds really cool, really interesting. And as I'm tasting it now, I'm like, I don't know. Maybe just my palate. You know, it just doesn't work yeah. for my palate. But I don't know. I'll still probably make a video about it. I find like all these international drinks just super interesting. Like finding. Mm-hmm you know, the origin of them and trying to make them at home. Yeah. It's really cool. That reminds me of a, um, well, I made a, I got this um, flavoring syrup, something from Amaretti, which is like, you know, they're, they're the company who does a lot of that stuff. And it was a uh, Michelada. And oh. I personally, like, I can't do Bloody Marys. I can't do tomato juice. Like that stuff is <laughs> no. like, oh, sure. but I was like, I have to, I have to do something with it. They've sent it to me. Yeah. So I ended up making it to a mead. And I mean, that, it, I mean, did a video on it and holy cow. One, I did not realize that there were um, like hot sauce and stuff like that in it. Yeah, and right. so I'm tasting it and I'm like, oh my God, it's so hot. Like, like burning my mouth and uh, it just is quite the event. But, yeah. Yeah, I'm not a Bloody Mary fan at all. And uh, I was at a restaurant one time and they, which was walking by with a whole tray, like six of them, and they all spilled right on me. <laughs> and that solidified it. I was like, I'm never touching Bloody oh, Marys ever again. <laughs> that is brutal. Oh, man. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I would I would say that there's, uh, you got a little curse when it comes to that yeah. now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> man. So uh, yeah, it's important for us to talk about our failures and that, this is kind of for everybody listening to as you as you talk about your successes um you know it's equal to also explain the the lessons you've learned and um uh, kind of going back to the oxidation with beer yeah i personally have done some beer not a lot but i do know that hops like you just said said a moment ago hops are extremely susceptible to light mm-hmm. and to, uh, I mean, uh, all beer is oxygen, stuff like that. But Mm -hmm. let's talk about that for a second. When it comes to hops and light, you're not fermenting in, I'm guessing, carboys at this point. You're probably fermenting in buckets or in a nicer setup. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Definitely light is a big thing to consider when you're brewing beer. Um, You can do uh, carboys and clear carboys, but usually the the idea is to wrap it in sort of blanket or they have, um, you know, even throwing a t-shirt on it, something to keep the light from hitting it. Cause once hops hit or light hits it, it's called a uh, light struck um, mm-hmm. or it gives it that skunk um, mm. flavor that sometimes they associate like Heineken with, or certain beers have that like distinctive skunkiness to it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, I ferment mainly in buckets or I have a stainless steel bucket fermenter um, that just keeps it light. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. And I'm guessing you're on your stainless steel setup. You probably have it to where it, it, you come straight out of there. You're not having to auto siphon and go through all that process. Yeah, yeah. No, I am a big hater of auto siphon. So anything <laughs> I can do to avoid auto siphon. So I put, uh, you know, 
the little faucets on everything on my buckets, I'll add it to it. So I don't have to auto yeah. siphon anything. Cause I feel like that is also a huge oxidation, right? You know, risk yeah. pumping it and who knows what's getting in there. Yeah. I, uh, luckily in the mead world, we don't, it's not that meat is impervious to oxygen at all, but it is, uh, from what I've read and experienced, there's a little bit less of an impact on yeah. on that. And even in some cases, um, not something I would condone and all, all the time, but making like a boche where you caramelize the honey. I've had experiences where a little bit of oxygen has actually helped temper down some of the flavors and the acidity mm-hmm. and those things. Uh, now, again, that's not something I'm going to say, yeah. everybody go and start pumping oxygen into your, your meads. That's, yeah. that's not it. But um, mead seems to be less susceptible to it, which is kind of nice. And that's kind of true for some like high gravity beers, actually, mm-hmm. like um, a barley wines or Russian imperial stouts. They do actually benefit from a tiny bit of oxidation to kind of mellow out the harshness mm-hmm. um, of the higher alcohol. Yeah, so, like, that makes sense that meads could benefit from it, too. I think it must be obviously lower ABV things like you're saying uh, can be hit more. Um, it's definitely those higher ABV boundaries. Uh, and I, you know, I have lots of projects where I'm doing high ABV stuff. And, you know, when you talk about high ABV beer, you're probably talking about like a nine percenter, right? Something like that. Like that's like nine that's, to 13. Yeah. Yeah. Somewhere around there. Yeah. We're, you know, mead world, wine world, really mead world. I don't feel like wine pushes past maybe you know, 14, that's probably the, where most, uh, wine hits Mm -hmm. mead people. We like to just let it go. You know, we, we go, let's, let's go for 19, 20. Let's see if we can hit 21. (laughs) Right. (laughs) So that, that, that involves a lot of aging, right? Like you have to let it age out a bit. Yes. I have, um, I have a project I'm working on. I I started a mead uh, that I want to age for 25 years. And uh, wow. it was like a wedding mead. And so yeah. open a bottle every anniversary is the intent. So in that planning and plotting, I had to think about, okay, well, how do I make this thing age for 25 years? So then you think about, you know, sulfites and SO2 levels and trying to neutralize that and make sure that's good for your bottle. And then high ABV. So it's sitting at like a 17, 18% because I think lower ABV would, would not age well. And then it also ends up sweet. So there's just like mm-hmm. so many elements for, um, long-term aging in a, in a mead that you kind of have to think about but yes the higher abv it's like whiskey you know it's like any right. spirit you're not going to go and drink that distilled whiskey after it's been done for a month otherwise right. you you know you're gonna cry trying to drink it so <laughs> yeah i always thought i people have talked about like they'll brew like a really strong beer or something and they'll you know if they move into a new house they'll put it into the wall and then just let it there. Oh. And then when they move out, hopefully the next person finds it and they'll leave like a note, you know, that's awesome. Or like mm. when you have like a, a child, if you have a yeah. baby and then you make a mead that day. And then when they turn 21, you can give it to them or something like that. That always, yeah, be- that's what, uh, I don't know. I think actually BC did start his, he started, okay. um, a, a, a Wojniak. it's a Polish mead. And they're the intent with those is they are super high gravity, super sweet, and they age for years. And so, same thing as me, but he's doing it for his kid. Um, so that's that'll cool. be fun to see. Yeah. But then you have to hold on to it for, for however right. long, you know, and you got to <laughs> yeah. put it in a bottle or for him, he's like bulk aging for three or four years. And so then you're like, you know, you're caught up with a five gallon carboy that's just full. And so, yeah. yeah. yeah and if you move, then it's a whole another thing. <laughs> now you got me thinking about my, this is the mead room. That'd be really funny when I move to put one in the wall and just yeah. like as a commemorative, um, I, I doubt anybody would find it. I'd have to put a note and be like, open up this part right. of the wall here or something. <laughs> Otherwise, yeah. I don't I don't think anybody would find it in here. Right. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so let's talk about uh, your, your brewing is obviously you do a lot of simple stuff, beer, wines, ciders. Mm-hmm. Now, there is one layer that makes your brewing a little bit different than everybody else, and that is that you are vegan, and so mm-hmm. you have to kind of uh, dance around some of the alternatives for things. And so one of my questions for you is, um, let's say compared to someone like me, what are some of the challenges that you see in brewing as someone who is vegan? Yeah. So luckily with beer, there isn't too many things that I need to avoid. There are, it's mainly in the fining agents. So uh, things like gelatin Mm -hmm. and uh, isinglass, which comes from fish bladders. Um, And then obviously, um, you know, if I'm adding 
some things like honey, unfortunately for, but, uh, um, so there isn't like a lot, like, you know, when it comes to beer, it's, you know, grain hops, uh, those are both plants and then yeast is a microorganism and then water. Mm -hmm. So it's fairly, you know, easy to brew vegan. Yeah. Yeah. You're just, yeah. The big one you said, you know, is, um, obviously finding, which can, you can work your way around that pretty easy, but then, you know, you're not able to dip your toes in the mead world. Um, yes. Necessarily. Yeah, but I actually did find an ingredient recently. I don't know if you've heard of this. It's called uh, vegan unhoney. Oh, which I haven't made, heard of this. Yeah, it's made from, uh, this one's made from organic coconut nectar. Interesting. And it's like, it's even like uh, caramelizing on top and it's thick. So I oh. it, it has me thinking like, Maybe you could give me a good recipe and we can. Yeah, I, I need to look up that. some of that. That'd be curious. I'd be curious to try it too. That sounds, um, it's, I, I wonder, um, I love doing AB tests. So my brain immediately went to like AB, you know, this, yeah. this, and this. And um, I do wonder how well people can synthesize what honey tastes yeah. like. You know, obviously it's very different. And that's the fun thing about honey for uh, most people is that it is so different. You know, if I take my wildflower honey that I get from my backyard, which I don't, I don't have bees, but let's say I had yeah. bees, you know, <laughs> and then I go to Michigan, you know, and get, and take their wildflower, it's going to be so different. Right. And that's, yeah. that's quite fun. Um, but I don't know how you do that in a non- non B way. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. I think they have like three versions, but yeah, I'd be, I'm just curious to see like if it would make a good meat alternative. Yeah. Well, maybe we'll, we might workshop something uh, yeah. with that then in the future. Yeah. <laughs> so your, your challenges are, I'm, I'm happy to hear that your challenges are not huge. Um, I did wonder about back sweetening. Mm-hmm. So um, obviously you're not able to use honey in, in the back sweetening agents. If you ever mm-hmm. did that, what are you mainly back sweetening with at this point? So probably the m- most common thing I use is dextrose or corn sugar. Um, okay. But I, I've in the past, I've used maple syrup. I've used uh, agave nectar mm-hmm. and they've all worked great. So, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, I've always been curious, especially when it comes to like the different kinds of sugars, turbinado and mm. different coconut. I've never really experimented with that. So I'd be curious to know. Yeah. And are you, um, are you stabilizing with sorbates and bedwise sulfites? Are you staying away from things when you need to? Yeah. So because I have that like background in wine, I have a little bit of knowledge in the sorbates and bedwise sulfites. So I, I do use both when I use, Mm -hmm. when I am stabilizing, but that is, you know, it's an interesting thing that I think a lot of beer brewers could learn from. It seems like they're almost afraid of stabilizing or they're, it just is like a very foreign concept because most of the time Mm -hmm. you don't really need it in beer, but there are times when it could be useful. I feel like going back to the uh, Russian Imperial stout, you know, the, the hefty stuff. Yeah. I feel like that could benefit, you know, the SO2 levels and adjusting that if you're wanting that beer to last a long time. And I have, I have some friends who, um, well, I have a friend who was a collector of, of beers and he would do, you know, whatever brewery would do this one, one beer, one time a year. And he would do the 2017, the 2018, 2019. Oh yeah obviously those beers are meant to last a little longer. I think at least, I don't know if that's their intentionality, but surely they they have to do some adjusting in order to allow them to age longer. Yeah. I'm I'm not sure. I know. Yeah. Stone had that uh, vertical series where they release the same beer every year. You're supposed to collect and compare, but I'm not sure if they use any sulfite or anything in that to, I'd have to, I'll have to reach out to maybe my local brewery. I know the one, the one I'm thinking of has done something like that too. Yeah. Uh, but that but, is an interesting problem. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. I was also going to say like, um, it's also really great for like the hazy IPAs, which are so su- susceptible to oxidation, mm-hmm. even like a little bit of, you know, metabisulfite could benefit them um, from, especially I would say uh, if you're bottling a lot of, you know, new brewers, mm-hmm. since any IPAs are so popular right now, they want to get into it. So using some sort of sulfite to ensure you get, you know, a, a good tasting beer might be worth yeah. trying. Oh man. I, uh, I used to hate IPAs and then uh, I don't, I had one IPA. It was probably the hoppiest one I could ever find. And somehow like my whole brain just flipped and I was like, okay, I like IPAs now. It's a, it was a weird, 
it was a weird day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I definitely was like that too. I, I didn't always used to love IPAs, but it's, you, taste buds change, I guess. Yeah, for sure. Um, you have, I'm guessing you have a kegging system. You do mm-hmm. most of your stuff, uh, most, most of your carbonation through kegging at this mm-hmm. point. Now, obviously with the channel, sometimes I, I'm sure you give the alternatives to bottle carbonating. And when you do bottle carbonate, are you using, you know, just regular primary sugar you find, cane sugar? What's your, what's your sugar of choice? Usually going for the corn sugar, just because I love how, uh, you know, easily it dissolves. You know, mm-hmm. you just sprinkle a little bit. And for a while I was, especially early on, using the uh, carbonation drops. And those are, I think, good too, especially for a beginner. But you know, I, I've never had a bottle bomb, but it's always something I've been concerned with. So, yes, you know, yeah. using being a little more accurate with like a dextrose is, I think, the way to go. And those take, I feel like they take a whole lot longer too, especially because right. they have to dissolve, you know, in the that dissolving process, it's not like you're, you're going to shake it up. Um, yeah, you're, you're just letting it sit there. And then of course, I've had lots of experiences where I've used the carbonation tabs and had things be even after, you know, eight weeks of bottle carving, um, right. be like pretty flat. I'm kind of like, uh, I could have not put enough in, but also it's a pre-measured amount. So it's like a catch yeah. 22, something went wrong. Not sure what exactly. Yeah. And if you're like collecting bottles, you have all different sizes. It's hard to like, know, am I putting mm-hmm. enough or am I putting too much? Yeah, it is a great, it is a great thing for people who are getting started. And obviously mm-hmm. most people who start in the beer world or cider, or any, you know, mead um, are probably not going to go and get a kegging operation to begin with just because Mm -hmm. it's, it's a big investment. You're not, you don't get in for cheap with kegging. Right. That's for sure. (laughs) So uh, I definitely, I've, I mentioned it in my videos, but most of my stuff is kegged now if possible. Yeah. It's nice to have the control, especially like if you're wanting to go super high carbonation, you know, you can really crank it up or, Mm -hmm. you know, you can, tweak it to the way you like and not have to worry about also not have to worry about cleaning a ton of bottles and waiting extra, you know, it takes up to two weeks, you know, I can get a keg of beer carbonated in, you know, 24 to 36 hours if I needed to. Yeah. I, uh, I recently as, as soon or as recent as of six months ago, have a full kegging operation. It has changed my world. Um, somebody asked me the other day on my discord said like, you know, what's the difference between bottle carving and force carving? And I said, you have, at least for me, I have full control of everything I want done with that brew. I can mm-hmm. get my carbonation level where I want it. I can use, uh, I can use honey safely to back sweeten, which is a huge thing for meads. Obviously, Mm-hmm. throw honey in an active fermentation you're going to get unless you do it right you're going to end up with a bottle bomb right. so that that full control is so nice but it is again the next step for people and i yeah. would not recommend somebody unless you just have money falling out of your pockets to uh, <laughs> start to you know start home brewing and get a kegging operation all in the same go so one okay. thing i found really interesting about your background um and, and something that i feel like is I'm still working on. You have a background in in photography and videography, yeah. so I, I'm sure that has made your channel. Uh, you've had an easier time <laughs> making videos than than I have. Um, how has that helped you? I guess in your video making process. Yeah. So yeah, video, I was a video maker. I guess before I was a home brewer. So uh-huh. um, once I got into the hobby and after a few years, it was definitely all, always on my mind to kind of like intersect the two. Um, I just felt like I had something to add something, you know, to make, mm-hmm. there was a lot of, you know, vid- great videos out there, but I felt like I could add something. So um, when 2020 did roll around and, you know, we had a lot more time on our hands, I yeah. um, decided to give it a shot. And yeah, um, I think it definitely helped me get off to a strong start. You know, I, uh, having been a fan of YouTube, well, as well. I kind of knew where I wanted to go with the channel and, and yeah, I just hit the ground running. Well, I think, uh, if, if people go back to the beginning of my channel, you know, I started off with a really crappy camera. I didn't have an, <laughs> I didn't have a microphone, you know, and it's very different from today. And I'm imagining had I, um, had the experience I do now, which is still, I'm still learning a lot, but mm-hmm my videos would have looked way different. And one thing I love about your channel is just how professional 
and how clean <laughs> every time I watch one of your videos, it is just, it is, I mean, video wise, just so nice to look at. And, um, and I, that's you. always impressive. It's very obvious. The first time I watched one, I was like, either he's got a, a team behind him is just like <laughs> kicking butt or this dude knows exactly what he's doing. And obviously it's the latter of the two. Oh no, thank you. I mean, it's definitely a lot of work and I feel like there's definitely areas where I could probably do less work and still come out with a great video, but uh, you know, I enjoy it. I enjoy editing. I enjoy filming. So it's been I, fun. Editing is one of those things that I didn't think I would like, but um, it is fun. There's something about it, you know, shooting is, is its own thing. It's a little weird. I'm sure you felt the same way at the beginning, at least when you're, it's just a camera and you, and you got to kind of figure out how to be personable with the camera, something that's not yeah. animated. You just kind of have to be different. Um, yeah. But then the editing side is just, you know, you don't have to be different. You just have to do your thing. Yeah. Editing is kind of where like the story comes together and mm -hmm. the fun happens. I mean, I have always been a guy that's been behind the camera, behind the computer. So putting myself in front was always been kind of weird. And oh. I definitely kind of, you know, I'm a little more reserved with how I show myself on camera, but I am trying to push myself to be more yeah. on camera and yeah. So you're getting more comfortable in that world now? Kind of yeah, yeah, yeah. stepping out front? Yeah. It, it's been an adjustment, but it, I enjoy it. And people have a good response to when I put myself on camera. So. Yeah. Well, that's, uh, I, uh, I definitely really enjoy watching your videos. And of course, as you know, we're going through this and talking his channel, um, Trent's channel will be down below in the description. Um, it is also the brew show. If you just want to look it up on YouTube, do you have any other, um, social medias that you put your stuff out on? Uh, pretty much, uh, Instagram is the other big one. And then I do have a discord as well. That mm -hmm. is a good group of people just looking to make beer and talk about beer and different fermentations. So, yeah. yeah. Well, let's talk about kind of get back into the brewing. Let's talk about yeast. So mm -hmm. are you finding yourself, uh, obviously every single alcohol has its different yeast need. Um, but are you kind of staying near the same yeasts in general when it comes to beer or same ones for cider? I, it's something that I'm always trying to push myself. I definitely have like my safe zones, which are, in the past have always been dry yeasts. Um, and a lot like, you know, wine, there's, there's only so many of, you know, the dry yeasts, but once you start going into like liquid beer yeast, there are like endless options, um, you know, for pretty much every single style of, you know, there's 99 official BJCP, uh, styles of beer. So there's at least a yeast for every single one of those. Oof. And then, you know, you have all these different companies. So I've been trying to push myself to try different brands as well as different strains and yeah, it, it's a lot. And I know for like beginners, it can be a lot too. So I always usually recommend is try the dry stuff because it's a little more narrow and as far as like, you know, usually just say English ale or a American ale or things like that, Saison. Uh -huh. And then you can try exploring into the different, more specific realms of yeast. Yeah. And it is quite daunting that 99 beer styles is a lot. <laughs> it's also funny, 99 beer, you know, that's, there's a lot of parallels <laughs> in that right there. Right. Um, but it is daunting. I recall vividly starting and I, I was like in the doing mead, you know, like, what do I use here? And it is all, um, a lot of the information I received was from other people who have mm -hmm. like, well, I've used this one and this thing before and it worked out well. Mm -hmm. It is great to, um, to follow what other people do, but it's also good, like you're saying, to experiment and see what happens when you use something you think might not work well in whatever you're making. Yeah. And it is challenging. Cool, I mean, one of the cool things you can do, especially with beer brewing is you have your wort, which is your own fermented beer. So you can go through a whole brew day, make one batch of wort. And then from there, you can always split it out and then try to, you know, yeast on these different ones and see how they compare. And it's always a fun experiment. Yeah. So let's talk about your, your iterations of your brewing. Mm -hmm. um, when you are recipe developing, doing that thing, are you, um, are you documenting, or I guess back, go backwards. Are you mm -hmm. doing that? Are you splitting up your batch into multiple parts and using different yeasts? Are you more so just like, well, I think this one will work better. Like, how are you doing that? So the way I usually go about recipe development is it's usually inspired by like an idea. So 
Um, I tend to brew by the season. So, uh, you know, if I, for example, if it's around St. Patrick's day, I, you know, I just brewed a, uh, Irish red ale. So I'll go mm-hmm. out and find a good example of that and taste it and try, you know, you can go on a lot of the websites. They'll have like the yeast they use or the hops they use mm-hmm. and maybe even the grains. You can kind of try and like infer what they may have done. Um, or if it's like a beer, I tried a brewery. That's really wild. I had a blueberry maple stout one time that just kind of blew mm-hmm. me away. And it was like, okay, I'm going to write this down and I'm going to go make it. And so I take inspiration from other beers or other things I see, or even just, um, I take a lot of inspiration from the food world too, like finding combinations that I love. Like uh, right now I'm drinking my latest uh, brew. It's actually a um, hard green tea uh, with melon. So I had a, I went to like a matcha restaurant once and they had like a matcha melon drink and i just thought it was super interesting like the mix of earthy and fruity and so then it's like okay how can i make that into a fermentation yeah try and i guess deconstruct from there that sounds really good um you know what i love about that is you you have a real world example of something a a flavor profile that you like and you've you said okay well how can i make this into a brew and that seems really Mm -hmm. obvious but i was talking to somebody the other day about their recipe development. And they said, uh, it was Carvin Wilson, who's, who's one of the big mead making people in the universe. And he said, before I ever start to, you know, put two flavors together, I'll go and do, use a million different combinations of that. You know, if I want to make a peach and vanilla mead, I'm going to go and eat peaches and vanilla ice cream. And I'm going to go and put, you know, peaches with my vanilla chai tea. Right? I'm going to do this and this before I ever put things together to see what kind of profiles I can achieve. And that is super important for people to try because it's, you're doing research essentially. Yeah. It's like a weird way to say it's it's research to (laughs) to make a better brew. Um, So obviously you're doing that too though. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just finding inspiration wherever, I mean, especially like you're eating food, you know, there's a lot of crossover between like brewing and food. So if you're finding something you enjoy, maybe there's a way you can incorporate it into a drink that yeah. you love. I would love to, I, I don't have the palate to do it yet, but to figure out food pairing and mead, wine, you know, cider, beer mm-hmm. pairing, like that just seems like it'd be so fun, but it yeah. also requires so much knowledge of like what goes well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, that, that is always a tough one. There's some great books on it, um, especially for beer. I know I'm, I'm sure there is for mead as well. Mm-hmm. There's one called, uh, it's hidden underneath this whole thing right here, but it's called the flavor Bible. And it's literally just like lemons. And then it says like the list of 17 things that go well with lemons. And then yeah. it's whatever, you know, <laughs> walks through like that. It's not really for brewing, but it's something that I've used and uh, had a lot of success in using. Yeah, it. yeah. That's great. I'll have to check that out. All right. Let's talk about your, you mentioned fruit. You know, Mm -hmm. you talked about that blueberry maple stout, which sounds Mm -hmm. really good. When you are introducing fruit, like the melon in that brew right there, Mm -hmm. um, how are you, how are you doing it? Are you mostly putting purees? Are you chopping up fruit? I guess it depends on the fruit in general, but do you have a general idea? Yeah. Um, it, it really does depend. Um, but for the most part, I try and source out the real deal. Um, and so like, for example, for this green tea, uh, with melon, I basically just took a sweet green tea and added yeast to it, let that ferment out. And then, uh, since I keg, then I just add frozen, I chop up, you know, like uh cantaloupe, froze mm-hmm. it, and then just add that into the keg. Okay. And then rack it. So oh. then, so the oh. cold temperature keeps, you know, yeast, the yeast from re fermenting it out, or at least slows it down to some extent. And, and until I drink it all, finish it. <laughs> yeah. but that's usually my route. Um, I almost like, I guess you could say like a dry hopping of fruit, um, mm-hmm. especially when, like with beers as well. Um, sometimes with ciders, I'll do more like uh, add it in to almost a secondary, but um, mm-hmm. I've kind of been moving away from using secondaries as much just to get to drinking faster. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when you're adding that fruit in the keg, um, I had that idea with something the other day and I was like, I stopped myself because I went, what happens when that fruit somehow makes it down to the post you're down to the, you know, and gets sucked up. Like, have you had any problems with that in the past? 
So I, I always put it in like a hop sock or like some okay. sort of muslin bag so that, yeah, that doesn't happen because I've had that happen um, with some like blueberry ciders before and yeah, <laughs> then it's a whole issue you got to deal with. Oh yeah. <laughs> I can only imagine trying to clean out that, that tube would be a pain because yeah. I imagine it doesn't go very far. It probably stops pretty quick. Yeah. I mean, a good trick would be to then shoot CO2 through your dip tube mm-hmm. and push it out, but you're still going to have the issue of it occasionally <laughs> coming up. <laughs> yeah. You only make that mistake once, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you're not your kid. So um, when you are, the melon thing interests me because I yeah. have done a cantaloupe. Uh, well, I have not done a cantaloupe mead. I did a fruit cocktail of sorts a couple of years ago, and mm-hmm. it turned out disastrous. And one okay. of the fruits I put in, in a small amount, was cantaloupe. Mm-hmm. And the cantaloupe was by far the strongest flavor there. So I've oh, been scared to use any melons in in brewing yeah. um it just seems it seems scary now at this point because of my one yeah. experience with it when you chopped well, it up is it is it big pieces or is it or smaller pieces I like uh inch or two cube oh. pieces yeah kind of a little bit larger um and one of the benefits of adding it into your keg is let's say you you know obviously in those first three pours you're going to get the most intense melon flavor and the earlier you know the earlier you drink it the more intense it's going to be but if it's too intense you can always take your keg out warm it up to room temperature and just like try and encourage fermentation to happen a little bit then it might mellow those flavors out and then you can put it back in or you can always try and reach in there and pull out the melon but that's a little interesting i would say risky but so you're saying it's more intense with whole fruit i feel like it'd be in my brain, you're you're steeping, or you know, you're you're, I guess, yeah, steeping the fruit mm-hmm. in that keg, and it would get more intense over time. I think I don't know, maybe it's just me, but the the sweetness, I guess, from the melon oh, is stronger so yeah. up front, and then would mellow. Out. I mean, I think the melon flavor is always going to be there, and if you over melon, mm. it's going to be hard to get it out. But I, I don't know what your like fruit to. Uh, mead ratio is but usually i you owe about like one pound of fruit per gallon oh, um yeah. that's my i found that to just work with most fruits that is um mine's a little more <laughs> we <laughs> normally shoot for uh depends on what you're doing you know if you're going yeah. like a big fruity berry whatever mead you're going three to four pounds normally um yeah. you know and if you're if you're crazy and you're trying to go no water then you are just using so much fruit, you know, yeah. you're getting 12 to 15 pounds per, <laughs> per a gallon of, of juice. Yeah. So yeah, we normally hit a little more, but I, you know, I have a recipe I'm still developing and it's a blueberry and cinnamon mead. Mm-hmm. And I'm trying to kind of play with my ratios like that and yeah. see if I can um, get that blueberry down so it can be a little bit cheaper. Yeah. <laughs> it's expensive. Right. It's a lot of fruit. Yeah. So is that like a cobbler inspired with the blueberry and cinnamon um, or? So I did a, I don't know why I chose that exactly, but I did a Star Wars mead series. And so, yeah, saw. you know, I did like a Yoda was green apple, you know, just mm-hmm. like what, what is green? And then, oh, uh, Darth Vader was raspberry and, you know, uh, like buckwheat honey. Yeah. So then I was like, well, Mace Windu is, is purple lightsaber. What can I yeah. get to purple? <laughs> okay. Well, so I landed on that and then, the cinnamon was just like a, I really like cinnamon in general, but mm-hmm. it's turned out to be super good. Um, it was one of those that was kind of a Hail Mary, you know, yeah. see what's going to happen. <laughs> and it worked out. It's one that I repeat quite a bit nowadays. Yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah. Blueberry is one of my favorite flavors to work with in any way I can. <laughs> oh, I love it. I uh, I had a, uh, I just opened a bottle I'm, mm, two weeks ago, but a hopped blueberry one I made oh. it's probably about nine, 10 months old. It was a little older, but it reminded me how much I want to start using hops again. I kind of yeah. strayed away from it because I was mm-hmm. got so busy with other projects as I'm sure, you know, he kind of yeah. trail around in the world. Yeah. yeah. But the hops are so interesting. And um, when you are deciding if you're not following a recipe given to you, when you're deciding mm-hmm. on what hops to use, are you, um, wh- what's your database for finding out your flavors? Do you have a website you go to? Have you kept a journal? Yeah, so pretty much all of these hop companies, they have websites and they all have like graphs or like they'll have like these little like, um, 
I don't even know, flavor oh, yeah. charts uh-huh. and they'll like kind of peak at different, you know, whether it's more tropical notes or more earthy or spice notes. Mm-hmm. And so I'm, yeah, I'm usually referencing those. Um, you know, one of my, you mentioned berry, like one of my favorite hops that gives me like berry notes is mosaic. So mm. if I'm trying to like really accentuate the berryness, I might go for that mm-hmm. and just look around at that. Yeah. That's a, uh, um, it's just such a different world for me because I don't obviously spend a lot of time in it. I'm sure it's like the same way people look at geese or people look at honey and, you know, stuff like that. It is a very in-depth world that you don't just like, you can't just skim the top and get all the information. You got to really go deep and and know what your options are. Um, yeah. And it, there are a ton of options too. And every year there's new hops coming out. So, yeah. you know, if, especially for like beer brewers, a lot of things, what they'll do is they'll do a smash beer, which is a single mm-hmm. malt and single hop uh, brew. So just to test out what is that hop like, you know, they'll use it throughout the whole boiling process to kind of see what kind mm-hmm. of flavors does it add. And that's a great way to learn the profile of a hop. Yeah. So whenever you're deciding on multiple hops, um, obviously you have your idea. Maybe you want more foresty notes. Mm-hmm. Are you, are you going to double down on two, hops that are extra foresty or are you gonna you know go foresty on one and then you know you got your citrus like how do you how do you debate that yeah it it depends on the style so um if i'm going for like an english ale or even like a german ale they typically are brewed with german or english hops Mm -hmm. and um they're more uh subtle in their flavors they tend to be more earthy more um floral um Mm -hmm. but then if i'm brewing something like a west coast ipa or a you know New England IPA, then I'm picking ones that are more tropical, mm-hmm. and I might tag team two of them: one that gives more of like a passion fruit flavor, and one and then one that has like a pineapple flavor, or oh, yeah. peach flavors, and kind of see how they work together. Okay. Hmm. You mentioned skunkiness earlier with yeah. light strickenness. Um, is it a universal aroma of skunkiness, or do you find it to be different between hops? You know what I mean? I, yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. Um, there, I think there is a difference. Um, you know, you can do a fun experiment to do if you even take like um, uh, your favorite beer, even like a light lager, and you pour it out into like a gla- three glasses, and one of them you keep inside, one of them you put outside for five minutes, and then another one you put outside for ten minutes, and you taste mm-hmm. the difference. You're gonna taste that skunkiness. Um, on the light streak and beer, you can really, it is kind of crazy. It even you know, as fast as like a minute, you're going to taste a difference. Um, but then on the other side, it, there is a, a dank quality that comes with some hops, which mm-hmm. I, it, you know, dank often reminds me of like weed, that smell that you get. <laughs> yeah. um, so there is a little bit of difference. I think um, I know there is some crossover between skunkiness and dankness, but yeah, um, I think when you taste the skunked, beer the one that's mm-hmm. left out in the sun you kind of can tell that it's something's not right <laughs> i'll have to i'll have to try that that seems like a fun test uh, yeah. also good for palate development um, yeah over time speaking of that how have you uh obviously the key to palate development is is tasting things but how have you found or what are some things you've done to help uh, develop your palate other than just trying a bunch of stuff um that is a great question um yeah i'm i'm like pretty adventurous i mean i'm willing to try almost anything once so um definitely i'm a big foodie so trying new foods trying different cuisines um especially international cuisines and Mm -hmm. just seeing like what other flavor combinations are out there I, i um made a uh maple brown ale and um as you know maple is a highly fermentable sugar so Mm -hmm. adding something like maple in the flavor of maple doesn't really come through um so i went to an indian grocery store and they sell this thing called um uh, it's called methy but it has another uh english name um but essentially it gives the uh flavor of maple and they use it a lot in like uh, maple alternatives Uh um and things like that so just like reaching into these other parts of the world to kind of like bring inspiration in and find new ways to, to bring yeah. something. Yeah. Another one that um, helps with maple is fenugreek. I don't know if you've that's, ever, that's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 Which I, uh, I, I had mixed results on, but <laughs> well, I can, I have a, a long-term project. One of my 
uh, it's going to be, well, it'll be probably a five-year project in the long run. I have a, a gallon of mead. I made two gallons of it originally. I left one alone to bulk age, and then I had bottled, you know, 12 bottles of the other one. And so they're theoretically the exact same. I mean, the only difference is one's in a gallon jug. The other one is in bottles. And so I've been doing tests over the years, you know, the, I just did a three year test on it mm-hmm. and it was a fenugreek mead. It was one of my first time ever entering a con- uh, competition and mm. my silly brain was like, let's use fenugreek and pear. <laughs> and I was like, let's be adventurous and use cilantro, which oh boy, <laughs> it was just a weird, I don't know what was wrong with me, but it, the fenugreek, especially nowadays, it, it tastes like maple syrup. Oh, and it's very, very interesting. Yeah. I was not expecting it. Yeah. I made a tincture with it. So I put like some of the fenugreek in like some mm-hmm. vodka. And to me, I just like got an overwhelming like uh, spice, but like not in a maple way, more like a harshness. So huh. I ended up not using it. And I don't, the flavor of maple to me always came across as like one for one, it's just sweetness. Mm-hmm. But the secondary character is like a smokiness. Mm-hmm. So I used like, I ended up using grains that had a little bit more of a roast character that gave a little mm-hmm. bit more smokiness to imply the maple when you drink it. Yeah. So speaking of maple syrup, um, in the mead world, well, I, I guess in the beer mead world hybrid, what we call braggots, um, mm-hmm. when you use honey, people have kind of stereotypically said that honey dries out a beer more so than not using honey. Yeah. Um, have you noticed in your maple syrup things you've done, mm-hmm. ha- has it dried out your beers more so? It, it, I think it does push it lower. Um, I mean, beers in general end with a pretty high final gravity in comparison, I would say, to like a mead. So, you know, usually like a 1.015 or mm-hmm. 1.010 around there. Um, so it does, it can push it a little bit, um, but nothing like significant unless you're putting, I guess, a ton which I haven't really done. Right. Well, I just, I wondered about the, I haven't done that with maple syrup specifically. Um, mm-hmm. but maybe one of my theories is that as obviously you are putting maple syrup in, you're probably, I guess most people would, um, cut back on your other sugars, but if it, if it's a higher ABV, it's going to have more harshness so i wonder if that is perceived as dryness i don't really right. know that seems yeah. like a theory i'm not sure i think yeah I, I would be curious to kind of test that i mean i brewed a graph which is a beer um a cider hybrid oh um, yeah which was super interesting and it like um my i feel like ciders do get pretty dry and mm-hmm. i feel like the beer kind of like brought it up. So it wasn't like overly dry. It was a nice, like I would say middle ground. Mm -hmm. too. Interesting. I've heard about that and I, I've never made one before, but it seems, it seems interesting. How do you, how do you blend the two styles? Cause cider is really just normal sugar. I mean, are you essentially just taking a beer and adding cane sugar, you know, some sort of fermentable sugar in to make it that? Uh, for the graph you're saying? Yeah. For it to be, yeah. Yeah, For a graph. Uh, So on the one that I made, I just made a normal beer recipe and then I just took um, some cider that I got from a local cidery and I just blended them, the wort and the uh, cider together. And I fermented it with a Saison yeast, which generally is, you know, a pretty like more light peppery flavor and Mm -hmm. it ferments pretty dry. So it is really fantastic. It's one of my favorite things I've brewed. Yeah. I want to, I, I need to try that now. That sounds fun. I really want to yeah. get more into beers and ciders are kind of my, my next little adventure. You know, I watched your, um, the one that inspired me recently was your, your pear, uh, oh, yeah. cider that you put out. I think you put out a couple of weeks ago. I saw that yeah. and I was like, man, I really want to get, get into that. Especially I have kegging equipment now. It's just, Oh yeah. Nice. It's, it's just like one of the easiest, like, I guess, brew days and quotes mm-hmm. there. Cause it's just, taking juice and putting yeast into it. I mean, you can get a little more complicated with it, but it doesn't have to be. Yeah. And 
it, one of my dreams is right now I'm, I'm fortunate. I have multiple taps in my house. You know, I want to be able to have a beer on tap and a mead and, yeah. you know, get a, a couple ciders and, a, you know, all, all these different options so that when people come over, they can go, Oh yeah. What do I want today? Right. But <laughs> I have a whole tap list ready. Yeah, for them exactly. <laughs> but one day, one day I'll get there. My wife not might not be as excited about it, but <laughs> right <laughs> until the list is full. So, um, all right. So let's talk about um, you mentioned spices. Have you done much with spices in beer up to this point? As like you know, are you using things? Uh, yeah, I have a few times, mainly around like the holidays, starting around October through mm-hmm. December. Um, that's probably the most often that I use it. So I've done uh, a few pumpkin pie spice. So I've done a pumpkin spice latte uh, stout that I did, which used pumpkin pie spice. And then I've done um, just like a pumpkin ale, which had uh, roasted pumpkin and um, pumpkin pie spice. And then as well in the uh, more like uh, December time, I've done a few like spiced ales or I did Mm -hmm. a gingerbread Saison there as well. Uh So yeah, I, I think it's a great uh, to use in beer, it's, you know, yeah. it makes a great pairing. Hmm. I have a, a, a peppermint mead recipe that I've been workshopping. Um, well, I feel like I finally landed on the, the end recipe, but I spent years just trying to figure out how to make it its best. And it requires you to get full size candy canes, unwrap yeah. them all. <laughs> you know, it's like, it boils down like a five gallon batch is like five pounds of candy canes. Oh, wow. And so it's, it's quite the event. It's, it's one of those that you only brew like once a year, obviously it's Christmas time, you know, yeah. you're not going to go and drink that in July. Um, right. <laughs> but it is, it's one of those you put a lot of work in and then you finish it. You're like, okay, that was a lot of work, but this is good. <laughs> yeah. I did a uh, collaboration with Martin from the homebrew challenge. I'm not sure if you're familiar with his channel, mm-hmm. but uh, we basically, it was a mystery box and we both sent each other like holiday themed boxes so I sent him one that was filled with uh, peppermint candies. Oh and he, yeah, he made a peppermint stout, which actually I thought was really great, and it had that like yeah. cooling peppermint uh-huh. thing to it that it just works. I don't know. Yeah, I was about <laughs> to ask you. You know, um, that that seems like something I'd be interested to uh, to try at some point, like a peppermint, adding that into a beer to see what kind of thing you can get. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely. Well, I, I think if you overdo it, it could be pretty brutal. Oh yeah. <laughs> My fear um, when it comes to jumping into the beer game, and I'm sure a lot of people feel the same way, is that Mm -hmm. honey is, while there are lots of options, it is also a little more basic. You know, you Mm -hmm. are getting a lot of sweetness, and unless your palate is just so stinking good, you're not going to notice all of the discernible differences between honeys. Malts and hops, you know, you're adding like a ton of variables when it comes to beer. And that that can be a little bit daunting, especially for someone like me, because then you're Mm -hmm. like, I don't know. I don't know what to do. Yeah. Um, luckily there's channels like yours, you know, who are presenting recipes. So the work is kind of halfway done. Um, you don't have to, to stress about it so much, mm-hmm. but the experimentation thing can be a little bit scary for beer. I feel like it can be. I mean, I think especially for beginners, if they look at like, you know, all the grains that are possible, it can be very o- overwhelming, but doing something like a partial mash, which is where you mm. buy uh, extract beer or wort is basically they take the wort and they condense it either mm-hmm. in liquid form or in dry form. Uh-huh. And that can be the majority of what makes up your fermentables. And then you mm-hmm. can start playing with grains. So you can take a specialty grain um, and then just add a little bit in and do a steep steeping it in like a bag to uh-huh. get a sense of what that's like. Um, and then you can go from there, but you know, there are a ton and they, each of these different grains, they add different levels of like, you know, if you're going for more of a bready or mm-hmm. if you're going for more biscuit, um, it can be a lot, but when you start to break it down into the different like uh, buckets, you know, you have mm-hmm. your base malts, which are, which are highly fermentable and they make up most of your recipe. And uh-huh. you have uh, your um, kilned or mm-hmm. lightly, um, which is basically lightly, uh, roasted grains. They add your color and a little bit of that sweetness. And then, um, you have your dark roasted grains, which are adding a lot of color, a lot of that coffee, dark, rich, um, color and flavor. Yeah. Um, when you think about it like that, then it doesn't become so complicated. There's a lot of little things in those buckets 
But if you pull like a little bit from each of those buckets to build your recipe, mm-hmm. then it can become a little bit easier to understand. Yeah, that makes sense. I haven't, you know, I haven't, I hadn't thought about it that way. I just, I started my, my uh, brewing journey started about five years ago and I wanted to brew beer. I'd done one or two with my brother and we'd done kits. So, you know, he didn't have to think hard at all. He just kind of pulled the stuff out and chunk it in. Um, and I wanted to keep doing beer, but then I looked at the list of stuff you need and I was like, holy cow, that's a lot of stuff. What's easier? And so I found mead and it was three <laughs> mm-hmm. things, you know, mm-hmm. it's a whole lot more than that now, but it was three <laughs> things back then and uh, started doing, doing mead because it was simple. And um, I think now that I'm deeper into brewing, more ingredients are not nearly as scary. It just mm-hmm. becomes, you know, I think everybody wants to do it right the first time. And that's, yeah. that's the nerve wracking thing with brewing, especially if you go experimental is that you're, you're just hoping that it works out, but that's yeah. also the fun part of it. So, yeah, no, definitely. I think that is very true. Like a lot of people get into it and they have wild visions of what they want to brew. I think it's important to remember that maybe take a step back and try and just like get, there's, there's a lot of like things that you don't think about like sanitiz- sanitization and, you know, Ox, like like we mentioned oxidation these simple like things that you don't know about when you're just getting started so mm-hmm. keeping it simple to learn the basics of how to brew is probably a little more important than trying to do your crazy pastry stout or whatever you're trying to do <laughs> your pear fenugreek cilantro <laughs> meat, right you know? right <laughs> <laughs> so i my here's my last little thing and i know you got your your busy guy and i don't want to take up all your time um i want to know because i love to just as you started a YouTube channel, you know, I want to help people feel comfortable. And every time I get someone on who has YouTube experience, I want to know what advice you have for them. Not just, of course, for um, brewing in general, you just mentioned, you know, keep it Mm -hmm. simpler. Don't, don't try and, you know, try to hit up the home run, you know, the first time, try and get used to it at first. What are some things for YouTube? If someone wants to start a channel, do you have any advice you would, you'd give? It's a good question. Um, I would say the big one is to just get started. Like uh, I, for years, had been thinking about doing a YouTube channel, but I was always, you know, that little voice in my back of my head, like, you know, maybe people won't like it. Maybe, you know, you, you got to just got to do it for yourself and you got to jump in. And as long as you're having fun and you're enjoying it, people will see that and they'll come to you and they'll watch your video. Um, mm-hmm. And the other thing I would say is, you know, just continue to learn, just keep uh, watching other people learn, you know, from other people watch tutorials. I mean, there's endless information on YouTube on every topic, but especially ones about YouTube, if you want to, you know, get better at branding, or if you want to, you know, just learn how to do different filming techniques or editing techniques, there's tons of videos on that. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, I'll say, um, consistency, I think was pretty important. Um, you know, just unfortunately, like the algorithm is a thing. And so feeding the algorithm, creating content, you know, keeping at least a weekly schedule is important Mm -hmm. if you want to see fast growth. So, yeah, yeah, I definitely, the algorithm is, is so real and very annoying, you know, and, (laughs) and it changes over time. Some days that is the one thing with YouTube that's frustrating is you could be going and then YouTube's algorithms like, ah, oh, just kidding. We're going to not do this, you know? And so you're just having to play the game. It's a little frustrating. Yeah. You just got to keep going though. Like no matter what, even if you're getting no videos, just keep doing it. As long as it's fun to you, just keep doing it yeah. and the views will come. Yeah. And, and on that note, I think you kind of mentioned it too. This is um, hopefully everyone who starts a channel, you're doing it because it's something you want to do because it's fun. Um, I feel like, especially YouTube commenters, I'm sure you see this too. They're pretty ruthless and they will sniff out um, if you're not being genuine pretty quick. Mm-hmm. And so being genuine about your passion is, is important. And obviously getting going with that. Um, yeah. It's, it is important to, to show, have good, have good quality stuff, but also show that you, you care and your actions. So Definitely, that's also yeah. just a life hint. <laughs> yeah. seriously. <laughs> like I'm talking about life or something. <laughs> oh man. Hey, well, Trent, where can we uh, point the people to everywhere we can find you and support you? 
Yeah. So I'm on YouTube. It's The Brew Show. That's all one word. T-H-E-B-R-U-S-H-O. And that's also on Instagram. Um, and I'm also on the Discord, which you can find a link on the YouTube channel. So yeah, sweet. Come on over. Well, I, I will be sending people your way. And seriously, everyone who's listening, I, I mean this wholeheartedly. Trent's production quality alone not just his brewing included but his production is so nice and it's made me realize i need to step up my game because it's so good and of course that is just the cherry on top because everything else he's putting out is is amazing so well, Trent, thank, thank you. you for thank you for spending your time tonight and uh allow me to interrogate you a little bit about your <laughs> life i appreciate it thank you for having me on a big fan of your channel as well i've been watching for a while so it's been fun well, well, I appreciate you. And uh, again, if you want to find all of the stuff for Trent, it'll be down below. You can uh, support him in every way you can. And we'll see you next time. So, Later. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>